Hello everyone, good evening. Welcome to the second chapter of ACC Career Compass, AI techniques to land and excel in your dream job. Before we start, I would like to ask you all a question. How many of us from here were there for the last session? Show, show of hands. Great, almost everyone. So for people who weren't there, a quick recap of what was covered in the last session. Last session was mostly about an awareness in AI. That just like electricity, just like our smartphone, AI is an integral part of our lives. And now the capabilities of AI is such that there are several tools out there which we can use to enhance our life our productivity, most specifically in our career. AI, when it first came out, we all used to think of terminators, killer robots, robots taking over the country, the humanity. One of the first AI assistant that came out was Siri. iPhone was released back in 2007. And then eventually, they came up with a voice assistant called Siri. So this is 2023, almost the end of it. Let's test how good Siri is. Hello. Hello there. How can I help? So Siri responds to what we ask Siri to, OK? Now, I was with my friend at work. And he asked me, what's going on in your life? I said, I'm very excited about the Cricket World Cup. Now, he's a white guy, so he asked me, hey, what is cricket? So I'm like, wait, I tried to show off. And I told him, wait, I'll let Siri answer for that. So then what I did was define cricket. Cricket is a dialect term. It means a low wooden stool, a footstool. Do you want to hear the next one? So Siri says cricket is a dialect term which means a low wooden stool, a footstool. I was extremely embarrassed because the guy who asked me a question, like, what is cricket? Now, cricket is such a popular sport. The World Cup is going on. But the AI, which was supposedly going to take over the humanity, doesn't even know what cricket is. So then I had to refine my answer. Or sorry, rather my question. I asked Siri, what is cricket, the sport? Cricket is an outdoor team sport played with a bat and ball. This answer is from Britannica. OK. So now Siri was better able to answer the question. Now Siri is just a tool that searches the internet, gets the answer for us. But the answer is only as good as the input that we give it to. So today's session, now think about generative AI. Siri does not come up with new ideas. Siri does not enhance our productivity. But generative AI, the capabilities is, are such that it's able to generate, like the name says. But the ability to generate is only as good as what we give them to generate. So that ability or that technique is called prompt engineering. Today's session is about prompt engineering. The input that we give to generative AI will determine the output that we get. So in today's session, we have two amazing speakers with us, two professionals. First speaker is Sahaj Ayer. He's done his bachelor's and master's from New York University, NYU. He's also done his CPA, and is currently a manager at RSM in mergers and acquisitions. So this tells us that AI is not only for someone who has a data science or computer science degree, but someone from a finance degree can also use it effectively. The second speaker is Jeet Sangvi, who's a data scientist at T-Mobile. So today, together, we are going to embark on a journey of a life cycle of a career aspirant from interviewing or applying for a job to getting a job. So without further ado, let's call upon Sahaj Ayer to start this session.
Yeah, so uh, Kruthart did a good job of uh, explaining what today is about. Um, I can go to the next slide here, which is what is prompt engineering? Um, and if you put what is prompt engineering into ChatGPT, you get this response, which is prompt engineering is the practice of designing inputs for generative AI tools which will produce optimal outputs. Uh, now, if you're, if you're like me, this definition means absolutely nothing to you, right? It's just a bunch of words. Uh, you can't really use it to do anything. Um, so I think the best way to learn what a prompt is is to just try it yourself. Uh, if you go into ChatGPT and type stuff in, eventually you'll get good answers for what you're looking for. Um, but from a theoretical perspective, uh, the four elements of a prompt are information, context, input data, and output data. Uh, so these things are pretty difficult to explain on their own. Uh, I th we can start with an example, I think, that'll do a good job of explaining it. So if I were to switch over here to ChatGPT, um, I'm just going to take this prompt right here, right? And give me a recipe with cheese and sauce. Um, I'm going to go ahead and copy this in. Oops. Cool. <clears throat> and if you type that in, it gives you a recipe for, uh, what was it? Cheesy baked ziti with marinara sauce, right? Now, ultimately, is this what we're looking for? Probably not, right? Maybe you were trying to make this, maybe you weren't trying to make this. But you can adjust the inputs just a little bit to get something entirely different, right? So now we'll type in, can you give me a vegetarian dish with cottage cheese and spiced sauce? Now, if you type this in, right? We just changed three words in the entire prompt and we switched big ziti to a uh, paneer tikka masala. So ultimately, because there's so much data involved, right, a slight deviation in what you're saying from versus what you actually want can get you very different results from what you were intending to get, right? It's like, it's very simple to think that like, if for example, right, if you were to take a car and leave your house, right, and you drive in a straight line, you'll reach a certain destination, right? And if you turn your steering wheel just a little bit, you'll still reach probably somewhere close to where you were going. But if you get in a plane and you go in you know, the correct direction and reach your destination, or if you turn just a little bit and you go off by like one degree, chances are you could end up in an entirely different country, right? Because you have so much more land you have access to um, and so much more speed you're going at. Ultimately, these generative AI pro programs go so fast that you need to make sure that whatever prompts you're using are good enough that what you're looking for is ultimately what appears. So, going back to the presentation here, right? Give me a recipe with cheese and sauce. Now, if we look at the colors, right? The green is the instruction, give me, right? The context in this case was missing. We didn't add any context. And we just said, cheese and sauce is the input data. We said, you know, use cheese and sauce to make this recipe. And ultimately, what do we want is a recipe. Now, by just adding three words, right? We add vegetarian cottage and spice into that context bar. And so now all of a sudden, with the, a little bit of extra context, we can switch from uh, an Italian pasta dish to paneer tikka masala, right? Um, so this is a good, I guess, silly example for what prompt engineering really is. It's making sure that all four of these criteria are, are properly entered into anything you're looking for. Um, ultimately, though, more career relevant, I think we can go to the next one, Oops. which is... How do I write a cold email to someone using artificial intelligence? And I think this is the more important example. So, um, like I said, the best way to do it is with an example. So I just found uh, this email online, uh, not an email, sorry, this job posting on the internet. Um, and it's for a business data scientist role at Google. I, th I think in the last session we learned how to tailor a resume to a, a role that you find online, right? There's ways to do that using AI as well. But given you've already done that, right? You have a resume and you've applied to this type of job. Um, oftentimes, these types of job postings, when they appear, they get, you know, maybe 10,000 applicants, right? There's so many people that would apply to this type of job. Uh, and one way to make yourself stand out is to sometimes email someone who works at the company and, you know, schedule an interview with them on the side, you know, like a meeting, not even really an interview, and just network with them, right? You can get them to know you, so ultimately they can refer you internally. And that way, your application has a much higher chance of getting escalated to the top of the pile versus getting rejected in a pool of 10,000 applicants, right? Um, realistically speaking, for popular companies, out of everyone that applies, there's probably 5,000 people that have the requisite skills for a given role. So it's extra stuff like this that really uh, puts you over the edge whenever you're applying for a job. So now, when we have the idea, we want to write a cold email to someone using AI, right? That's our idea. If we go to the next thing, we can prompt this in ChatGPT. So we can, uh, we can just take this here. 
So we can go right here and we can just type this in. Uh, can you write me a cold email? What about Dobby? A data scientist role at Google as a new graduate. And we're doing this really live now. So um, if we type this in, right, it's gonna start generating. And it's gonna generate a whole email for you pretty instantly, right? Now, if you look at this email, right, it looks pretty good at first glance. Um, but there's a few issues with it. One is that the hiring manager's name just doesn't exist, right? Ultimately, you wanna have the name there. But <clears throat> two bigger issues that I can think of right away is that this is really long. Like, nobody who you email who doesn't know you is going to read an email that's this long. They'll see something like this and they'll just ignore it. Um, the other thing is that if you look at this, the wording is very uh, formal. It's not written in a sense that you're trying to have a conversation with somebody. It's written that you're trying to apply for a job to somebody. And the third thing is that um, if you look at what's actually being said, right? I'm writing to express my interest in the data scientist position at Google as advertised on your career page. This isn't something you'd ever send anybody when you're actually looking for a job, right? Because it tells them that all you're interested in is the job. You're not interested in them as a person. Um, and so if you sent this, you might actually um, give yourself a pretty bad impression internally with whoever you're applying to. So we want to change this just a little bit, right? We're not happy with this just yet. And the good thing about ChatGPT is, is iteration, right? If you wrote this email, right, and you showed it to somebody and they said, no, this is all wrong, you have to rewrite this. Uh, it would take you quite a while to rewrite something like this, right? It would, if you wanted to apply to a lot of jobs, you'd be spent all day writing emails like this. But with something like ChatGPT that can generate these things pretty instantly, you can make edits very quickly. And so ultimately the number one thing I recommend to anybody is to just keep typing stuff in, right? As, until you're completely happy with what comes out, just keep iterating over and over again until you get ultimately something that's good. So we're gonna go back to, back to here, right? And we're gonna say, you know, first of all, let's find somebody, right? So I just searched LinkedIn. Um, I found this guy, Andrew Smith, right? Uh, random connection. He's a data science manager at Google, right? And all I did was I just scraped whatever was on his LinkedIn page, I took the text off of it, right? And I just found some basic information about him that, hey, this is a guy I can contact, right? Now what I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna go to my next page here and I'm gonna put this in. So now, rather than emailing somebody random, we're gonna edit this email, so I'm, the person I'm emailing is Andrew Smith, data science manager at Google. And I'm gonna say in this prompt, use slightly simpler language. So we're gonna go ahead and type this in here. Edit this email. Cool, so we're gonna enter that in and ChatGPT is gonna start generating again. So now his name is here, number one, big improvement, right? Um, and you'll see that the language that they're using here, um, I'm eager to bring my analytical skills and passion for data science to Google. It's a little bit better uh, than what was previously being used, right? Comparing it to what was above, which is extremely formal. I'm particularly drawn to the prospect of contributing. Right? Nobody actually talks like that. Ultimately, if you send somebody this type of email, they'll know it's AI, they'll know it's artificial intelligence, and they'll say, you know, I can just hire a machine instead of you. Right? Ultimately, uh, people want to hire humans, not machines. And so you want to come off sounding like a human and not a machine. Um, and so that's the first step, right? Now we have his name in there. We have the right role in there. We have his role in there. Um, you know, we have some other stuff that's like slightly simpler language. It sort of talks about yourself a little bit. But we still have some other issues in the sense that it's still way too long. It's still very direct in asking about a job, right? We didn't fix that yet. And so ultimately, we're still not happy with this. So we're going to go right back here and we're gonna talk about something called parameters. So parameters are hidden functions within ChatGPT that exist for every single prompt. If you've ever uh, typed anything into ChatGPT, these parameters all held true for what that was, right? And there's default settings for every single one of these values. Um, obviously there are too many to talk through right now. The one I wanna talk about is temperature. So what temperature is, is uh, it's, it controls how random the output is. So given that ChatGPT will generate something for you, the higher the temperature is, right? And temperature is a value between zero and one. The higher the temperature is, the more uh, random and sort of uh, with flowery text the output will be. And the closer to zero the temperature value is, uh, the more simple and sober the language and direct the language will be. Now every single prompt you put in ChatGPT has a temperature value of 0 0.7 by default. Right? But you're allowed to adjust that depending on you know, what you're writing. So if you're trying to write a poem or a novel, uh, you can put that temperature to one and you'll get a lot of different words and like vocab that you'll never hear again. But 
For something like this, where you want to be slightly more direct, you can change the temperature value down a little bit, and you'll get more simpler language that doesn't use you know, as much wild vocabulary. Again, the main goal of using any artificial intelligence is you want to make sure that nobody knows you're using artificial intelligence, right? You want to make it seem like the intelligence is your own if you're the one applying for a job. So we're going to go to the next prompt here, right? And we have, if you read this prompt, immediately the first thing I do is I change the temperature, right? So right now if the temperature in that, what was generated is 0 0.7, um, I'm going to adjust that down to 0 0.4. So the words are slightly less complicated when they're used. I'm going to make sure that ChatGPT says, don't, act, don't ask directly for a job. Instead, ask to connect for a short call or in-person meeting. Right? I want this person to think that I'm interested in them, not just in getting a job from them. Uh, if I'm just interested in getting a job from them, the first thing that they'll think is, what are they getting from me? And the answer is probably nothing. Right? So ultimately, I want to make sure that I'm not too direct in asking for a job. And then I'm going to say shorten the length to two paragraphs, right? Because the length was too long initially. So this is a bit of a longer prompt, so bear with me here. Um, um, raise of hands. Who thinks this will become shorter when I type this in, what I ultimately entered before? We have a few, we have a few hands raised. Now, when I set the temperature to 0 0.4, it's going to make the words a lot more simple, right? But the most important thing in here is don't ask directly for a job and instead ask to connect for a short call or in-person meeting to ask about their career journey, right? Now, previous AI programs that existed for text, they could do these things, shorten the length and set temperature. These are parameters that have existed before. But the ability for a generative AI program to understand this sentence and adapt it into the text you're writing into something that sounds natural is a pretty new thing. So when I hit enter here, um, we're going to start generating. Right. And you'll see that this is a much better, much better email to read. I trust this message finds you well. Having recently graduated, you know, there's a lot of stuff. But ultimately, it's pretty short. It's only two paragraphs. Right. Now, if, someone were to, if you guys were to generate this email, would you be okay with sending this to somebody who you were applying to a job for? Raise your hands if you think this is okay. Nice. I'm glad. So, no, you shouldn't be, right? And there's a few issues with this still. So, the number one issue that I see is you can still tell that this is something that comes from a computer. Like, Anybody could write this email and apply for a job at Google, and there's no difference between this email because there's nothing personal about it, nothing personal to who you're emailing, and, and nothing personal to yourself. So what we're going to do is potentially the last step, and we're going to go back, and we're going to talk about being personal to make it more interesting. So now, I read on his LinkedIn page that this guy is interested in running, right? So I'm going to add a short sentence near the end saying that I saw you're interested in running, and I'm a new marathoner who just ran in the New York City Marathon, right? Now, hopefully this is true. Uh, I don't encourage lying at all. Um, so ultimately, pick something in common that you have with the people who you're connecting with, and just try to throw that into the email somewhere, right? So we're going to take this. Um, we're going to go back to ChatGPT, and we're going to say... So we're going to type that in and hit enter. And you'll see that the email is relatively similar, right? but it just added a paragraph here. Additionally, I noticed your interest in running, and I wanted to mention I'm also an avid runner who completed the New York City Marathon. I believe shared interests can foster meaningful connections, and I'd be thrilled to discuss our mutual passion for running during our conversation. Right? Now, this is a pretty good way of writing this. right? You could have sat there for 10 or 15 minutes and tried to think of a nicer way to say this. But with something like this, right? if you're applying to a lot of jobs, you can just generate this stuff super quickly. Um, ultimately, applying for any job is a numbers game. You're probably going to have to apply to several jobs before you get one. <clears throat> but by having a tool like this at your disposal, you can spend or waste uh, less time writing emails like this and instead have something generate them for you, right? The best way to think of ChatGPT is like a personal assistant. You just have to tell it what to create, and it'll create it. But ultimately, the most important thing is your directions. Your instructions have to be as clear as possible. Because if they're not, you'll get something that's completely off track. And the other thing I encourage is whenever you get like a generated thing like this, always read it just to make sure. Um, things can be wrong always, and things are often wrong when you're reading this. Um, the only reason this works so smoothly, honestly, is that I sat there generating stuff over and over again until I got a prompt that worked perfectly, right? But ultimately, when you try this the first time, you're probably going to get something crazy that's not correct. And so you just want to be careful and mindful that whatever you do, uh, you get the correct output out of it. So just keep reading whatever you get and make sure it makes sense. So... You know, ultimately, after sending this out, right, say we email this, and woohoo, they want to interview you, yeah? 
say you get a response and now you have this guy who wants to reach out, you know, he's interested in your running, he's interested in your career and he wants to hire you for a job, potentially, right? Now, what do you do at this point? Right? Everything you've had to do so far uh, was pretty simple because you were the one creating all of it. You found the guy, you were emailing him, and now, but now all of a sudden he wants to interview you. And so now there's a whole lot more unknowns, right? Because the questions that he's asking you, you don't know about. Uh, there's no way to predict what he's going to ask you. There's no way to predict if he's even going to ask you good questions. Ultimately, there's nothing you can do except be prepared for what is most likely to happen. Um, previously, you had all the control, and now as soon as he wants to interview you, the control is sort of out of your hands and into his hands, because the questions lie with him. So <clears throat> there's a few things we can do to address that using ChatGPT as well. And this is where I want to talk about something called uh, role assumption. So role assumption is when you uh, prompt ChatGPT to assume a role, right, said simply. So for example, if you want recipes, you can make ChatGPT behave as a chef. If you want historical data, you can make ChatGPT behave as a historian. And if you're like me and you just want things explained simply all the time, you can just make ChatGPT act and talk to you like an elementary school teacher. Um, and that's one I use a lot. I, I recommend trying it out. If you have like a very complicated subject, like prompt uh, generation that you want to learn about, just type that into ChatGPT and say, explain this to me like a five-year-old. And you'll get like a very helpful output all the time. I use it a lot. Um, but side note, if we want to go back to this. Um, so role assumption is forcing ChatGPT to be something right for you. So if we go to the next page, Right, how can I make ChatGPT assume a role? So can you assume the role of this person and ask me questions they might ask me in an initial interview? Right? So we have the instruction, which is can you assume the role? We have the context, which is in an initial interview. And we have the output data, which is ask me some questions they might ask me. And then the input data is of this person. Well, which person? Right? You really have no idea which person it is. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do, right? The easiest way is to just type in who it is, right? You can type in, if you were a manager at Google, what questions would you ask me in an interview? The most specific way to do something like this is if you just take all the text off their LinkedIn page, something like this, right? I'm going to do this live for sure because I can't type this in. Um, we're going to copy all of this, right? And we're going to go to ChatGPT. We're going to go back to ChatGPT. I'm just going to go ahead and um, paste this in. I think I didn't copy the R, so we're going to type in the R there. I'm going to paste this in, right? Which is his full resume, right? And it's going to give you like a nice summary of the resume, whatever, that's fine, right? But what I'm going to say is can you, uh, what was the prompt? Can you assume the role of this person and ask me questions they might ask me in an initial interview? <clears throat> so ultimately, it's going to turn into Andrew Smith pretty instantly. And it's going to start spitting out questions that this guy might ask you in an interview. Now, keep in mind that this isn't every question you could be asked. It's not even any question you might be asked. It's just what is most probable to be asked, right? You have no idea what he's going to ask you, so you're just playing a game of numbers at this point. You want to have ultimately some things prepared that might come up so you have some answers and you're not fumbling in the moment. But you also just want to use this as a guideline that this is some information I should have prepared and I should have some alternatives prepared as well in case he asks other questions, right? So we have this whole list of questions here that it spit out, right? And all of them, if you look, is ChatGBT asking as if he is Andrew Smith. The field of data science is rapidly evolving. How do you stay current with the latest advancements of technologies in data science and analytics, right? These are all interview questions that a hiring manager might give you. So now if we go back, right? I just have a whole list of the questions here. Um, in PowerPoint, and you know, we don't need to read this, right? But it just spit out a ton of questions instantaneously, right? And something like this would have been almost impossible to do previously. I remember when I was applying for jobs for the first time, maybe five years ago, I would have to go on like forums, like online forums of the companies that I was applying to, if you know, like Wall Street Oasis or one of those sites, and you'd have to look up like what are potential questions if you're interviewing for this company. And even then, you had no idea if the people were being truthful. You had no idea if they're being honest. Like you had no idea if they're just lying to you because they were applying for the same job and wanted you to fail, right? So. Now we can just take it out of other people's hands. We can use a program to generate questions for us. Um, and by doing so, we can get a much more accurate listing of questions that might be relevant if you're potentially interviewing for a job. Now getting the list of questions is one thing, right? And you can sit in your house and prepare for these questions all day. Uh, ultimately, though, that doesn't really do anything because you have to come up here and speak, right? You have to go in front of the person and say these things live. And a majority of communication isn't in the words you're saying specifically, it's in how you're saying them. Can you speak confidently? Uh, do you have good body language? You know, things like that. Or you get nervous in the moment of. 
And for those things, ChatGBT cannot help you at all, right? Because it's just text-based. But there are AI programs out there that can help you actually interview and give mock interviews. And so, you know, if you're really nervous about interviews, stay tuned because we have a few tools like that that'll help you out to ultimately speak well when actually giving job interviews. So um, I think Jeet is coming up next and he's going to talk through those. All right. So Sahaj showed us some really cool uh, prompt engineering tricks that got us noticed, and we now finally have a job interview. So we started with writing a cold email. We iterated through the process maybe a couple of times. He introduced a few parameters that ChatGPT uses, and then we used the temperature parameter to finally make it pretty concise and to the point that we wanted it to be. We then send out the email, and guess what? The hiring manager liked it so much that he got back to us, and now we finally have an interview. So what's the next step now? The next step is to nail that interview and get that job. But how do you practice for that? I'm sure everybody in the audience has at some point given an interview, or probably are in that stage where they'll start giving out interviews in the future. So just by a show of hands, how many of y'all have given an interview in the past? That's a pretty good volume. How many of you are here that haven't yet started the interview process and are going to start it in the near future? Pretty cool. So I'm sure everybody that have gone through the interview process, all of you guys have had your fair share of challenges as you go through the process. Sometimes you fumble, sometimes you get nervous, and most of the times, you're confident enough, you give that interview, and you never hear back from the recruiter when you ask for feedback, right? It's always, I hear that from a lot of people that you reach out to the recruiter asking them for feedback, why did you not get the job, and you never hear back. So what, could, what can you do in this case? Maybe you can do a mock interview with a professional or a friend that might always be there, but you know that's not always possible. It's not always possible to do a mock interview, especially if you have two or three interviews lined up in a week. So let's leverage the power of AI and have the ability to practice right at our fingertips. I've personally tested this software called Udly. There might be a bunch of other softwares out there that can help you do the same thing, but this is the software that I've tested, and I think it gives you really great results. Udly is an AI-powered speech coach that helps you improve your communication skills and gets you in that confidence that you need to be for your final interview. And, that's, and that too, that's without the pressure of an audience or without the need of a person actually taking your mock. So currently there are three sections on the app here. Okay, the, the screen's there. So there are currently three sections on the app that you can use. You can either practice for a mock interview, you can practice a presentation that you're probably giving at work or school, or maybe you can just practice conversation. Maybe it could be a small talk with your colleague, or maybe you want to ask your manager for a raise. You can practice everything on this app. But coming back to where we were, Sahaj showed us how to use, how to generate a cold email. The manager liked our cold email. He got back to us. Not only that, Sahaj also showed us how to generate a list of questions specifically tailored for that job position. And he actually covered a, a very interesting topic in ChatGPT, which is called role assumption. ChatGPT assumed the role of a hiring manager because Sahaj fed the input of what the manager does currently. And ChatGPT actually generated a list of probable questions that you might answer in the interview. What the good thing about Udly, the app that we are using currently, is you can actually feed those questions into Udly, and Udly is going to give you a really nice mock experience as if the hiring manager is asking you those questions. But coming back to where we were, we have a set of questions that we'd like to practice and get the confidence before our final interview. I've taken a couple of questions that Sahaj generated using ChatGPT, and I've fed them into Udly, and we can actually do a mock here and see what kind of results the app is going to throw at us. I'm actually looking for volunteers. How many of you here are into data science, data analytics? That's it? I think there are more. <laughs> 
just by a show of hands, how many of you here are in data analytics and data science and will actually be brave enough to come on the stage and do a mock interview? Oh, we have one person right there. Can you come up on stage? Hi. What's your name? Chirantan. His name is Chirantan. Oh, we have one more volunteer. We just have one, one mock, so we'll actually go with... What's your name? Pranav. Pranav. What do you do? I'm studying masters in data science at NJIT. So he studies masters in data science at NJIT. And are you looking for jobs? Yep. And I'm graduating this semester. You're graduating this semester. Yes. Can you come? Okay. So are you ready for the mock? Sure. Is the audience ready for the mock? Yes. So you'll have three questions here that will pop up on the screen. All you have to do is look in the camera and answer those questions. You good with it? Yeah. Okay, so let's start it. Let's hear it for Pranav. Okay, I'm Pranav, currently pursuing Masters in Data Science at NJIT. I'll be graduating in December 2023, and I'm looking for uh, data science and business analytics related roles. A little bit about my uh, uh, previous work history. Look in the camera. Uh, previous, uh, previously, I have worked for about 3.4 years in uh, uh, in uh, IT sector uh, with various organizations. I started my career with Cognizant Technology Services uh, as a programmer analyst trainee, where I uh, where I worked with Cognizant for about eight months. And after that, I went for National Aerospace Laboratories and followed by Dassault Systems, where I worked for about 2.4 years, which was the most relevant experience that I have. Thank you. Okay, there was there was this time uh, back at Dassault Systems when I was in the Katia team. We had we had to collaborate and build. Uh, we had to build some software, uh, some test cases uh, using Python automation. We had to automate test cases for this uh, software called Cadden. Um, so I had to collaborate with my team and it was a long effort. Uh, we had a lot of issues facing what py uh, Python packages to face and use and uh, what software to uh, automate on. And so that took a while and for efficient collaboration, uh, we were in office, but efficiently we were using Skype and other or uh, other um, collaboration places and uh, uh, we had internal tools as well, uh, which I obviously cannot disclose, but uh, we did have some international, internal collaboration tools, uh, which helped us uh, to efficiently uh, function with uh, different teams in order, in order to get anything working which was not already working. Thank you. Okay, this is an interesting question. In my case, I am very passionate about aerospace and astronomy, and I like seeing the applications of data science in this field. This is a very emerging field. This is one way which uh, I keep uh, keep up, uh, keep myself up with the um, with the latest trends. Well, recently we f uh, this recently we got the first ever photograph of uh, of a black hole. They, the data needed to take that one photo was huge. It was five petabytes. That's huge amount of data. And data analytics required for that was crazy. And just reading about it is giving me more and more insights into what's going on in the uh, market today. Apart from which, I also follow up with uh, follow with. Uh, bigger companies such as Meta and Microsoft, which are uh, which are having uh, very significant um, contributions in these domains. Microsoft, because they are uh, they they are now um, now the since Microsoft took over ChatGPT, they kind of are the owners and they are doing quite a lot of research on ChatGPT. That's very interesting. 
so that is one of the uh, uh, that is one other way which i keeping myself up to date with the latest fields thank you okay first of all let's give a huge round of applause for pranav this is not easy coming up to an audience and giving a mock interview but you are the bravest among the crowd <laughs> thank you so much so now we actually have an interview recorded and this is where the power of udly unleashes i'm going to save this and let udly generate some analytics on how well the mock interview went all right i think we are ready so just taking a deep dive into what udly is uh giving feedback on so you see on the extreme right there are two sections here one is coaching and one is analytics we'll start with analytics just to see what are the metrics uh and how is it rating us overall so as you can see there are analytics on two different variety of uh delivery styles one is word choice and the other is delivery what it's essentially saying is i think it's still generating the text so i'll let it complete before i dive into it okay i think it's done now so it essentially tells you what really went well from a word choice perspective and what could have gone better it it's telling me that i the repetition of words were just 3% which is still less than the natural 4% repetition that everybody does in their speech he used a few weak words and weak words are nothing but words that you use to put emphasis on your sentences he he was scored at 2% which is still lower than the natural average of 4% so that's a really good sign now this is where you can use most of the feedback that udly provides and improve on your speech so what it's telling you is there were instances in the mock interview where filler words were used and what i mean by filler words is uh, um okay and that's 9% the average is around 3% what udly suggests you is instead of using those filler words it's a really difficult task to do you should actually pause and think about your next sentence rather than using those filler words the cool feature about this is it's also going to tell you the instances where you actually use those filler words so i'm just going to play something here let's see if this works i'm looking for uh, data science and business analytics related roles a little bit about my uh, previous work so you see how it very greatly recognizes your filler words and puts them right in front of you after the mock is done the next section is conciseness if you get into a mock interview and you speak on speak for probably 5 minutes or 10 minutes and the content is still the same you're probably converting your active sentences into passive sentences or summarizing or rephrasing the same sentence over and over again that's what we have to all stop soft and this is what they are uh, they soft because they are uh, they they are now um now the since microsoft took so you see how it identifies parts where you keep on going over the same sentence over and over again and asks you to stop that and the last part is sentence starters so we often have this habit of sending starting all the sentences with one particular word it could be and it could be i and udly very aptly recognizes that for us and you can see it's going to identify those areas and put them right in front of you once you're done with your mock this is just one part of it this is all the analytics under word choice and then we can go into delivery and see how well the delivery was so he was looking into the camera so you'd least telling you that you were looking good because you were smiling your face was right in the center of the camera which is again a good thing pacing is something that a lot of us struggle with we are either extremely fast or extremely slow if you're extremely slow you don't really grab the attention of the audience if you're extremely fast the audience is listening but the audience does not capture anything you're saying so the ideal speaking uh pace is around 115 to 170 words pranav did a really good job he was in the optimal range throughout it also tells you what could have gone better 
because Prana was actually contacting with the audience as well as looking into the camera, there were instances where he was not looking into the camera. But this is something that can easily, easily be solved for. The next section of analytics that Udly can provide you is coaching. So this was, the first part was what I spoke and how I spoke it. But the next part is coaching. Everything that you said in the inter interview, whether it was good enough or maybe you could have done something differently. So the first part is, Udly is telling you, here are the key points your audience took away. So Pranav started by saying he's pursuing a master's in data science and looking for roles in that field. So what you really want to make sure every time you do a mock in Udly is go through this section where Udly is capturing the key points and make sure these are the exact key points you wanted the hiring manager to listen to. Because what happens at times, we might be all good technical coders or we might have really good technical skills. But if those skills are not conveyed to the hiring manager, those skills are, are, are probably of no use. The next part is it also gives you feedback on particular questions. So let's say, let's take an example here. So question two that was asked to Pranav was, give an example of a project where you've cross collaborated with other teams. And he provided an answer where he worked at his previous employer and he described a few projects, right? So what's you, what you'd be saying? Actually, let's go to the answer that Pranav provided. So this is the answer that Pranav provided for the second question. So he says there was a time back at the salt systems when he was in a team and he had to collaborate and build on some software and write some test cases using Python automation. Uh, we had to automate test cases for the software called Kden. And he had a lot of issues facing with Python packages. And that took them a while. I don't want to get into details of all the audio that's transcribed, but let's go to just what Udly is saying. So Udly is saying overall you provided a really good overview of your background and work experience. However, your response did not directly address the question about collaborating with cross-functional teams to, deliverable, to deliver actionable insights. And then it gives you a few specific bullets that you can improvise on. So it's, it's asking you to provide specific examples of a project where you collaborated with a cross-functional team, speak more confidently and clearly, avoiding unnecessary pauses, and showcase your relevant experiences. I think Pranav did a very good job speaking confidently coming up to the stage. So there will be at times, this is, and you have to keep this in mind, this is artificial intelligence. There are going to be times when it's going to tell you something that wouldn't make sense. But I think overall Pranav did a really good job and spoke confidently. So there are going to be times when it's going to give you feedback that might not necessarily work for you, but please keep that in mind that this is artificial intelligence. And the other good part, the last part that I want to highlight in the software is as you speak, Udly is transcribing everything that you're speaking into text. And what you can actually do is once you're in the transcript, let's go to one particular answer from Pranav. So if this is the answer that Pranav provided, I want Udly to make it more concise because that was the overall feedback that Pranav got that he had to be more concise, right? So if you click on this option and say rephrase concisely, Udly is actually going to give you the answer for that. So rather than saying all that Pranav said, Udly is saying you could have probably just concised it by saying the following. So this is a really good tool because now you don't have to wait for somebody to give you to take your mock and you have a feedback system that's feeding directly into you and saying what could have done, what you could have done better. But in the end, please remember, this is a utility tool. This is for you to practice. Getting all the questions right on Udly will still not guarantee a, a interview that you would pass. But what it, this is essentially doing for you is it's going to give you that practice because back when I was interviewing, I did not have this software. And what I did was I went to six interviews in a row, repeated the same mistakes over and over again until I finally realized that I have to fix these mistakes. So what this is going to do is this is going to reduce those number of failed attempts that you have initially. Because trust me, when I started interviewing, I had no answer for tell me, tell me something about yourself. 
I literally had no answer for that. I used to fumble. I used to go on saying the same things over and over again. And it took me six interviews to figure out the answer to that one particular question. Thanks to Udly, you don't have to do that anymore. And you can get all the feedback you, that's needed. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Once again, a big round of applause for Jeet Sangvi and Sahaj Jayar. So, I did my engineering from Mumbai University. Um, don't look so sad. There are a lot, lot of people there with me. And over there, it was taught to me that during exams, that if there's a 10 mark question, you need to write at least six pages. So hustling was something that I was taught. Then I came to America. I studied hard. And then I realized that landing a job is a whole different skill. I, I was used to hustling. So me and my friends, we used to have a competition. Like, oh, I applied to 100 jobs today. I applied to 50 jobs today. And portals like LinkedIn, Indeed, easy apply, one job applied. Indeed apply, one job applied. I want to ask, how many of us here have done like 300 applications for a job? OK. Is this the lower figure? 500. Whoa. Anyone who's touched four figures? 1,000? Pranchu, OK, we have a few. Big round of applause for them, too. So working hard is something that has been ingrained in us. But from today's session, by being iterative, by being specific, by adding in the context, and by assuming a role, we are adding the smart in our work. And not just that, we are enabling the per assistant that is supposed to work for us to be smart as well. So today, I would like to conclude that the input that we give to the machine, that determines the output that we get. And the interviewing skills, the application skills, they're different from the academic skills. And ACC's career compass is aimed and geared towards bridging the gap between the academic skills and what is required by the industry. So to end, I'd like to wish everyone happy Diwali and happy prompting. Now we will have a 10 minute break and then we'll all see you for someone where you meet. Thank you everyone.